Thank you. Um, I have to tell you that having lived in Minnesota for many years, um, coming to Chicago always fills me with um, appreciation for this part of the country. And fall is, fall is beautiful, and Chicago is really putting it on today. So I'm very jealous of you all. Um, I know Adam is too. Um, we were you know, a little um, nervous about doing this um, exactly five days before the moment when all of us will be sitting in front of a screen, small or large, waiting for the uh, results to come in. And so, um, and we're actually you know, very impressed that all of you turned out despite um, all the news that's breaking at the moment. And just to stick with the presidential campaign that's so much on our minds, um, and because we titled this The Power of Words, I wanted to ask you which words or phrases have stuck with you from this campaign that you know, now almost was, you know, binders, Big Bird, Benghazi, or maybe it was something a little more substantive. <laughs> I think it was the phrase that they didn't want to get out, the 47% phrase, which uh, thanks to you and your colleagues of Mother Jones, uh, that's the, I think that may be the phrase that gets remembered from this presidential campaign. And why do you think, what, what do you think connected um, about that phrase? Well, it seems to me that, that one of the roles of good journalism all through history is to show power relations, show what people don't necessarily want to have seen, and that that uh, Romney video uh, of how he spoke when he spoke to a group of his very wealthy supporters was enormously revealing in those terms. It was revealing both by the contempt that he showed uh, for this 47% he was talking about. I thought it was also revealing in that it showed somebody whom we're used to seeing look a little artificial and ill at ease, be completely relaxed when he was surrounded by these $50,000 a plate donors. Uh, so uh, I don't know. That's what, one of the things I took away from it. Um, obviously, there, you know, Adam and I have in common um, that we were both editors of Mother Jones at a time when a really huge story broke. Um, for you, it was the Pinto. For us, was it was forty-seven percent. And you know, you mentioned the video, and there's a way in which people think. I think that now that you can get sometimes get your hands on this kind of video, this kind of documentary evidence the craft of writing and editing is no longer really called for because all you have to do is put that material out there. Um, do you think that's true? No, I don't. I think there's always going to be a role for good storytelling. Uh, I mean, sometimes things come along where you, know, you get a, a secret video of some, someone making a speech and that speaks louder than anything you could say about it. But usually, I think it requires figuring out how to present the story in a way that will speak to people, will move people who don't necessarily think of themselves as being interested in this subject uh, to begin with. And that, I think, has always been the role of good journalism. Uh, for my generation, we thought about it in terms of writing. Now, when you edit the magazine, I would have to go back to school all over again to become an editor of Mother Jones today, as I was you know, 30 years ago, to learn video and web design and all these other kinds of things, because when you present a story, it has to be um, with all these additional uh, ways of communicating with people attached. But I think how you, how you present it um, always remains uh, really important. You mentioned the, the Pinto expose, which was really the story that first put Mother Jones on the map. It was published in 1977, which was a year after we first started publishing. And some of you may remember uh, the Ford Pinto at that time was the most widely sold car uh, in the United States. And it had a disturbing tendency to burst into flames when <laughs> hit from behind at fairly low speeds, like 15 to 20 miles an hour. Uh, 
and something like seven or 800 people have been burned to death in such accidents. Oops, my microphone, oh, here we are. Uh, had been burned to death in such accidents. Well, we discovered, Mark Dowie, who was a reporter for the magazine, uh, discovered that Ford's engineers had, before the first Pintos started to be manufactured and rolled off the assembly line, they had discovered that this was going to happen because the Pinto's gas tank was between the rear axle and the rear bumper instead of being in front of the rear axle or wrapped around the rear axle. But they had calculated that the cost of retooling the assembly line to put the gasoline tank in a different place would be more expensive than paying off the anticipable number of insurance claims of people who were killed or injured in these accidents. And we got the memo where they made that calculation. Uh, but it was still a quite complicated story. It spread over about 12 pages in the magazine. It involved diagrams. It involved historical precedents, you know, talking about accidents when they first invented the, the air brake on trains. And uh, figuring out how to present the story was a very important part of it then, and I think it still is today. Did, um, did you think very much in how you um, were presenting it about how it was going to be, how it would resonate, how it would tell a story that people could relate to even if they were not directly affected? Well, uh, I always like to think that if you've got a really good story of any kind, whether you're telling it in magazine form or book or anything else, the story has to have an echo to it. For me, the echo of the Pinto story was that there is something wrong with a system that says the decision whether to make or not make a dangerous product like this is purely based on money. It costs more to retool the assembly line than to you know, pay off the insurance claims. That's the message I hope people took away from the story. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm always looking for what is the larger echo when you tell a smaller story. Mm -hmm. And you tell it, I mean, even what you did just now when you told the story, you had, there was a narrative arc to it. You know, there was, it, it, it certainly held, you know, this, this crowd's attention. And that seems such a distinguishing characteristic of um, magazine journalism as a, you know, a nonfiction narrative. Um, as opposed to um, the also you know, really important craft of the classic newspaper story where it would be very much more, you know, your classic lead would be um, memo shows lawyers calculated cost of you know, yeah. casualties from Pinto fires as opposed to how it actually, you know, how the story was actually constructed where there was you know, somebody that this happened to and then it slowly opened the aperture to um, the larger narrative and then the echo um, that you mention. Um, do you think that kind of narrative is possible with a lot of the way that people ingest information now? Um, I think it's, in a way, it places a higher value on doing this kind of narrative because straight news, the facts of what happened yesterday, this morning, in the last hour, in the last minute, everybody's got already. They've got it on their cell phone. They heard it on the radio when they were driving to wherever they are. You know, we sort of know the facts of the day's news uh, in an almost up to the minute way, in a way that certainly wasn't true when I was a kid. But I still think that, so I think that means that when you tell a story in a magazine or in a book, you have to do it with a kind of craft that draws somebody in, um, that doesn't assume this is a news, news item, but I'm gonna take you into a piece of someone's life, uh, or the life of a community, or the life of a group. Um, one of my favorite recent Mother Jones stories, for example, was when uh, Mac McClellan, the magazine's human rights reporter, 
uh, spent some time working in one of these vast warehouses that services mail order. Uh, you know, when, when you order something over the internet, it ends up in one of these gigantic warehouses where people are rushing around trying to fill orders so it can be mailed off and you know, get to you by FedEx or UPS the next day. And the working conditions in this place are absolutely atrocious. She worked there for what, a week, two weeks? Mm -hmm. Something like that. Described it in excruciating, painful detail, how it made her feel, who were the people she worked with, um, you know, how they were getting by, you know, minimum wage jobs, many of them living in trailers. This is the kind of thing you will never get in a Twitter message on your cell phone. Although, interestingly, we find that, you know, since you mentioned Twitter, that um, there is a lot of narrative power to those kinds of media, too, because a reporter can tell a story in these little staccato bursts that build up over time. Um, it's, it's really fascinating experimenting with that. Um, and I wonder if, you know, you, you have been, you know, it's often said that um, journalists are historians in a hurry, and you've been on both sides of that divide. Um, and in, in working with your, you know, you've worked on um, mostly eras where there are no longer, there are no living witnesses you could talk to. And so in reading correspondence and, you know, these sort of fragmentary pieces of stories that you then have to patch together into, you know, long sustained narratives, do you find that the the story is contained in the fragment, as it were, that the seed of it is already there? Yes, I do. And when I write history, which is mostly what I've been doing for the last 20 or 30 years, to some extent, the piece of history that I choose and the people through whom I choose to tell the story, it depends, it's partly dependent on who has left a record uh, of what they were uh, uh, doing, thinking, you know, letters, diaries. Diaries are absolutely, you know, do future Everybody historians a, a favor <laughs> and keep a diary. Uh, keep your letters, especially your love letters. Um, in my last book, To End All Wars, I found two wonderful successions of, of love letters. Um, uh, one between the uh, British commander-in-chief on the Western Front in World War I and his mistress. He was writing very indiscreetly to her about all kinds of military maneuvers and, you know, backbiting inside the, the British Army High Command and so forth. Wonderful material. And the other set of love letters were between Sylvia Pankhurst and Keir Hardy, two of my real heroes in this book who were anti-war activists. Uh, also having a, a forbidden and secret love affair. Um, and uh, they were passionate about each other and passionate about the cause of trying to uh, prevent this war, which was uh, destroying so much of the world that they, they knew. So to some extent, when I choose characters, it's because I can find their voices in the past. Um, and you know this becomes a challenge because the voices that you can find are not always the voices you would like to find. It's much easier to find voices of the rich than of the poor, of white people than of black people, of slave owners than of slaves, of colonizers than of the colonized, and so forth. But if you look hard enough, um, you can find those other voices. And uh, that's what I've tried to do when I, when I write these books. The people that you were just talking about um, lived in, you know, a time that really changed their world, and it feels as if we're in such a time now. You know, New York City was just underwater. Um, you know, we um, are winding down two wars, and you know, the world is full of conflict. Do people, at the time that they live in one of these tumultuous eras, accurately diagnose in their writing? Um, what the tumult is about? Or is that something that only you as the historian can see later on? Yes and no. Uh, I mean, sometimes a revealing thing to a historian, you know, looking at something with our perspective, is to see what people take for granted. 
Um, one of my books, Bury the Chains, was about the anti-slavery movement in the British Empire. And, you know, the extraordinary thing about the world 230 years ago or so is that almost everybody took slavery for granted because most people on earth were in slavery or servitude of some sort or another. Millions of slaves of African descent in the Americas, most people in Russia were serfs, you know, indigenous slavery all over sub-Saharan Africa, in India and China, uh, most people were peasants in death bondage to landowners. You know, this stuff had existed for millennia and people sort of took it for granted and sometimes the fact that they did take it for granted becomes a quite fascinating part of the story. When I was looking, for instance, in that book, uh, which was specifically, as I said, about ending slavery in the British Empire, I wanted to find a representative slave plantation in the British West Indies to use to describe what life was like on a slave plantation. And I picked one uh, where there happened to be uh, abundant records, although there were several that uh, I could have picked. I picked one because uh, it seemed to show something to me about this taking for granted business. The plantation was owned by the Church of England and the Archbishop of Canterbury was on the board of directors uh, of the church's missionary society, which actually owned this plantation. And so you can see correspondence between all these bishops, you know, talking about, you know, increased harvests each year and how many slaves they're gonna buy off the slave ships and so forth. So the fact that they didn't question, that they didn't think that they were living in a time of tumult, because all over the world at that time, people were beginning to, to question the institution of slavery, that becomes a fascinating thing in itself. And then, of course, the really interesting people in the story are those who thought differently mm -hmm. and who did question the morality of slavery, and those were the ones that I mainly focused on. That's interesting. So they were measuring their world not against its own moral standards, but a moral standard that they derived from, from outside that context somehow. Yes, yeah. Which, you know, I is an interesting thing about investigative journalism because there are two schools of, of what we do. One is to look for violations of laws or hypocrisy where you know, internal standards are being co contradicted. Um, but then there's also the, the strand of it that exposes things for being wrong in some larger way, like things that might be legal but wrong or fully accepted but wrong, um, which is a little bit what happened with the Pinto story, really. Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder if you've found yourself, if you've found people who have articulated what it is that you can measure things against if it's not the law and the customs of the society that you're in. Well, it's always a mystery to me, um, but a fascinating mystery. That, I want, that makes me want to delve into it deeply. I, I seem to be drawn to these moments where everybody, almost everybody, took something for granted, like the institution of slavery. Uh, and then there was a small group of people who came along in the 1780s in London who felt this was something morally wrong and they were quite brilliant organizers and really helped to change public opinion in Britain in a surprisingly short period of time. Where did that conviction inside themselves come from? It's hard to say. For each person, it was sort of a different story, but sometimes, thanks to the records that people have left behind, uh, you can put your finger often on a particular experience or a particular moment uh, one of my favorite people in that book is a man named James Stephen, who, although he didn't know it, was the great-grandfather of Virginia Woolf. Uh, he, was, uh, he was a young London dandy, a lawyer uh, in the 1770s uh, and 80s, and he got himself into terrible hot water because he was married to one woman, engaged to another, had made another pregnant. You know, it was a 
tremendous domestic mess, and he did what a lot of young British men at that uh, time did. He fled to the West Indies to make a fortune there because that was where you could get rich quick. Um, when he got off the ship for the first time, was on the island of Barbados where they were making a stop, and uh, some people he knew there said, you're a lawyer, uh, there's a trial going on right now that you'd be interested in because it's just winding up. It's the last day of arguments. Come with us and watch this trial. And the trial was of four slaves who uh, were being tried for the murder of a white man. And Stephen's friends on the island told him, this whole thing is a sham. Uh, it's a put-up job. Everybody knows who the real murderer was. Uh, uh, who was a white man, but they're trying the slaves. The slaves were found guilty, and Stephen was there when they were sentenced to death by being burned alive. And he was so shocked and horrified by that that it changed his life. He then, while working in the West Indies, began secretly sending information back to the abolitionists uh, in London. Uh, after about a dozen years having made his fortune, he returned to London and bec became the chief behind the scenes strategist in Parliament, getting the abolition bill through Parliament. So I love to look for those moments, and I've found some in, in some of the other times and places I've researched, where somebody had a revelatory experience that changed how they felt about something. And it's a fascinating story because he and, you know, a fairly small band of others really changed the course of history. And I know that people um, get um, fairly demoralized about the possibility of, you know, I think uh, in, in his acceptance speech here in Chicago four years ago, Obama um, talked about bending the, the arc of history um, ever so slightly. And even that sometimes seems out of reach. So. Have you found yourself gravitating to these moments because in retrospect we can see that history, that the arc of history does bend? Well, I think so. Actually, with that book, Bury the Chains, you know, it's almost entirely about stuff that happened 200 years ago. The last three times that I've been asked to come somewhere and speak about it, it's been to groups working on climate change. So I think people see a connection. How important do you think um, language and words are in that process? Um, I mean, climate change is such an interesting word because it went from being a fairly neutral phrase to having really you know, fairly toxic connotations um, to the point where even people in favor of doing something about it hate to use it. Um, does... Um, do these words change connotations because public opinion changes, or can they be used to change public opinion? Well, I think you need more than words and more than the right phrase for something to change public opinion. You need stories. You need to um, show how people's lives are being impacted by whatever is the subject at hand, whether we're talking about slavery 200 years ago or climate change today. Um, it's appalling to me, for example, speaking of climate change, that there hasn't been more said in the media in places other than a few places like Mother Jones about you know, what the impact of this hurricane would have been like if the sea level was already six or eight feet higher, which it well may be, you know, 50 years from now, where would New York be then? It wouldn't just be the powers off below 32nd Street, below 34th Street. It would be off everywhere. Uh, and, you know, we need to make those connections. And I think the, the stories of how these larger things impact people's lives, that's what changes how people think, not the particular words or phrases that are used. Mm -hmm. That goes back to, um, and it's pro we're probably biased because we are storytellers, um, but um, it does seem as if the human brain is organized to want to see reality in the form of stories. Um, 
we did um, a story not long, not long ago about um, Bob Carey, who's running in Nebraska to um, recapture his old Senate seat. And he's also, you know, of course, he had a, a cathartic moment um, with investigative journalism 12 years ago when it um, came out that he had been, um, that the unit he commanded in Vietnam was involved in a massacre. And the, in the story we did, there was this very interesting moment where he talks about war and the way we, um, the way we talk about war. And he says his opponent had said something like, well, if Iran won't come to heel essentially on the nuclear program, we'll just have to go in. And you can, you know, I only read this, but I could practically hear the, the um, indignation in his voice as he said, go in. What do you mean go in? Who goes in? What mm. does the going in look like? Mm. And right there, I think you could see the full arc of Bob Carey's personal experience and the experiences of the people who he was trying to connect with, some of whom have sons and daughters um, in Afghanistan. Um, do you see politicians using storytelling in this way to connect people's personal experiences with the, with the issues that we face as a society? Not enough. Uh, I mean, just to stick with climate change for a second, I'm just, you know, so disappointed that it didn't get mentioned in the presidential campaign at all. I don't think there was a single question about it in any of the debates. Well, Bloomberg certainly changed that. Perspective. Yeah, Bloomberg, uh, Bloomberg is, is aware <laughs> that the climate is changing. Obama and Romney are aware also, mm -hmm. but it's just not considered politic to mention. Um, and I think, you know, this hurricane could be a teaching tool on that. Uh, I think, you know, there is such power in the presidency to lead on issues like that. And some, sometimes you have to lead by telling stories and by pointing out the implications you know, of these quite a few years now of severe weather events that we're, we're living through. What this means, how we prepare for it. Uh, I, I do see a deficit of storytelling about a couple of really big issues like that. Was the press did the press do any better in some of these other eras you've looked at? Um, did the press, I noticed that in, um, in To End All Wars, um, you mentioned that a fair number of the people who really took a stand were journalists who ended up in, in prison, um, some of them for long periods of time. Um, overall, was the press braver, more truthful? I don't know, I, I, I'm afraid the press usually reflects the general feelings of whatever the era is. Uh, you know, there were very few people in the, the newspapers of the day who, who questioned slavery in any way in the, the era we were just talking about, the late 18th century. Um, I did a book which some of you may have read, King Leopold's Ghost, about the um, uh, colonial conquest of the Congo. And, you know, colonialism was something which almost everybody in Europe and almost uh, everybody in the European press took for granted when that was going on. There were very, very, very few uh, journalists or articles of any kind which, which questioned it. But those people who did do the questioning, those are the ones who, who interest me. And again, wondering what was the experience that opened someone's eyes? Because if we can find the experience that opens an individual's eyes, then maybe there's some way, you know, as journalists and as writers, we can find to tell stories that will open other people's eyes. Um, the extraordinary moment of sort of revelation for, for the guy who was the central character of King Leopold's Ghost was this young man, uh, Edmund Dean Morell, uh, was not a journalist at the time. He was a 25 or 26 year old shipping clerk. Uh, and the shipping company he worked for, a British company, had the monopoly on all of the cargo traffic between Belgium and the Congo, which was at that time the personal possession of King Leopold II of Belgium. 
And Morel, because he, he spoke French, was sent uh, every couple of weeks to the Belgian port of Antwerp to check in his company's ships. And he noticed that when they arrived in Antwerp and unloaded, they were filled to the hatch covers with enormously valuable cargoes of rubber and ivory. And rubber especially is tremendously labor intensive, wild rubber to gather. And that when they turn around and sail back to Africa, they carried no trading goods in exchange. They just carried soldiers, firearms, and ammunition. And watching this, he realized, I am seeing evidence of a forced labor system 4,000 miles away, because there's no other explanation as to where all these riches are coming from. Um, the word was not in use at that time, but to me, that moment of revelation was one of the great moments in modern investigative journalism. Because Morel, who was then just an employee of this shipping company, went to the head of the company, said, uh, there's something terrible going on here. There's clearly forced labor involved. We shouldn't be a party to it. The head of the company told him to get lost. When that didn't work, uh, tried to promote him to another job in another country. That didn't work tried to pay him some money to shut up. That didn't work. Morel quit his job, and in the space of three or four years, he turned himself into the greatest investigative journalist in Britain, um, devoted himself to uh, putting this story of slave labor in King Leopold's Congo on the world's front pages. So I love moments like that, because it really you know, does suggest that uh, a dedicated man or woman and the profession of investigative journalism really can make a difference. That's, that's really one of the best encapsulations of um, what investigative journalism means that I've ever heard because it's, it's, it's just that moment of connecting the dots and saying these two things together mean something that we need to understand. Um, I'd like... Um, you in the audience to also join our conversation. There are mics at the front and uh, we'll have time for a few questions. While you gather, you will need to come up to the microphones so that um, your question is recorded as part of the recording of this program. And while you gather your thoughts, um, I'd like to ask you one question in honor of Tom Engelhardt, who couldn't be here, um, but who's on that invisible chair over here. <laughs> um, Tom Engelhardt has been your editor for many years, and you've been an editor to other people as well as a teacher. Um, so maybe you can tell us what a good editor does. Well, this is something I think I first began to learn during the time that I worked as an editor at Mother Jones, which was for the first seven or eight years of the magazine's existence. Um, there were a group that varied in number from you know, three to five of us who were editors at the magazine at any one point in time. And we would have an editorial meeting once or twice a week. And every piece under consideration, and it was much simpler in those days because there was just the printed magazine, there wasn't the website. Um, every piece under consideration would have been circulated to everyone in the group uh, beforehand. And uh, you know, we'd talk about each one. And this included pieces that we wrote ourselves. And these meetings were very tough. You know, people would say, you know, this doesn't work, that doesn't work, this article's too long, it's, you know, 5,000 words when it should be 2,000 words, it sags in the middle here, there's no suspense, you know. It, and I really learned a lot from that process that I think what I learned was this, that you know, when your ambition is to write, you tend to assume wrongly that any word that comes from your pen or your word processor or whatever is somehow rather sacred. But it's not. Uh, it only works if it succeeds in convincing people of what you're trying to convince them or moving them in the way that you want to move them. And for me, those early years of editorial meetings were tremendously valuable because both when it was a matter of an article that I had written, a draft of an article I'd written, or um, that someone else had written that I'd solicited for the magazine, sometimes it would go through three or four rounds of revisions with people talking about it in the successive meetings. 
and I realized good writing is something that has to be laboratory tested on somebody or some group of people to see if it accomplishes what you, the writer, or the writer you're working with is trying to accomplish. That's what those meetings were for me. And I think a good editor is that kind of laboratory for a writer. Uh, I've been very lucky to have Tom Engelhardt uh, as my editor on my last three books. Uh, and some of you also know him, I think, through his website, uh, tomdispatch.com, which is incorporated into the Mother Jones website uh, as well. And, uh, you know, on, on the, the first book I did with him, in response to my first draft, this was King Leopold's Ghost, he wrote me a 36-page single-space letter about everything that was wrong with it. He makes no, he never wastes any time on telling you what he likes, you know, because <laughs> that is a waste of time for an editor. What, what you can best do as an editor for somebody or as a friend reading a writer's work is tell him what doesn't work. And he always gets right to that and then, you know, the same thing happens with the second draft, the third draft, some chapters, you know, like four drafts I ran past him. And it's trained me as a writer. I incorporate a lot of people into the editing process. When I do a book, uh, I will inflict the manuscript on almost any of my friends who are willing to read it. And I always tell them, tell me where you get bored. Tell me where you get confused. That's what I want to know. That's what I want to know. And I think a good editor points out those things and much more as well. I think that sound you hear across the land is the sobbing of all the writers who don't have Tom as an editor because that kind yeah. of nobody gets 36-page single-spaced yeah. letters about their book anymore. Um, you have a question, and I'll just go back and forth between these two mics and take as many questions as we can fit. Uh, I appreciated the distinction you made between newspaper journalism and kind of magazine journalism and the idea of revelatory moments and stories. and. When the 47% article came out, one of the things I was, and so I guess there's a question embedded in here, although I don't quite know how to phrase it as a question. What I was really struck by when the 47% story came out was there was coverage that was about the revelation, but there was a lot of coverage that I heard that was about debating whether the 47% was actually 47% or some other percent and how it was defined. And I. I couldn't figure out how that was the story because that wasn't about what the revelation was about. So I don't know that there's a question in there, but I'm just wondering if you can comment on that. Well, I think that um, goes back to what Adam said early on is that part of what resonated so much about that story was an emotional connection that people made to what they saw in that video. Um, that they could tell that here was somebody speaking to people that he felt comfortable with and being fairly honest about how he felt about everybody else. And I think that made people, that that's a difficult thing to articulate and so it made people start to, th start to ask questions like what was he even talking about? Whom did he mean? I mean there was something very illogical about the phrasing of that passage um, of his comments in any case because as, as of course you all know, the 47% who are not voting for Mitt Romney um, and the 47% who don't pay income taxes and several other 40-some percent um, groups are not the same people. Um, and there, is, there was absolutely no logic in mashing them all together but as a narrative, as a story he was telling, it made sense because it was a fairly accurate rendition of how he saw a large portion of his fellow Americans, would you say? Yeah, I think the story was his contempt for most people in this country. <laughs> <laughs> Should have really just, said the 99%. That's just my, my take. You have Do you have an actual definition of the word story? that would distinguish between a story in the Wall Street Journal and a story in the best American short stories of 2011 or whatever it happens to be. Because I just perceive that there's too much crossing of the line there. 
and all of a sudden it seems like you can't trust anything. You can't trust what's fact and what's fiction. And is there a way of doing that? Is there advice you can give us to handle this situation? Well, I think another thing I learned from my early days at Mother Jones is the importance of good fact-checking. Uh, Mother Jones, like uh, several of the top magazines, has a fact-checking department. And what that means is, as a writer, when you turn in a manuscript, you get it back, marked up, usually in a system of inks of different colors, from a fact checker who wants to know your source for every assertion that's made in it. Where does the statistic come from? This quotation, do you have it on tape? You know, this fact, you know, are you sure of that? Because I have another source over here that says something else. And it's a wonderful lesson. It was a wonderful lesson for me, much later becoming a historian, to go through this process of seeing my, my early stories for Mother Jones and, and some for other magazines as well, fact-checked. And to me, the distinction is between, um, you know, stories that appear in publications or in books where facts are taken seriously, where, uh, you know, the writer is expected to have a reputable source for any assertion, statistic, quotation, anything like that, and places where it isn't. That's the key, that's, that to me is the key distinction. So look at your source. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Your question over here. I grew up in India and uh, about, uh, I hadn't come to the United States then, I visited England, was visiting a pen friend of my father. They were both writers of a club and had been pen friends for 20 years. So I was staying with him and we started talking and I was astounded, though he was a very learned gentleman, he had no idea about what the British had done in India. So when I came here and I sit today and see, uh, People here do not know what's happening, what we are doing around the world. So why have we not moved ahead? We still are stuck in the same place where the population at large is so devoid of real information, uh, whether it's Afghanistan, whether it's Iraq, or any other place that we go, or other kinds of policies that we have, whether it pertains to large multinational corporations, you know, polluting in those countries, the people here seem to have no idea about what actually our government does. Because when I travel, they are the ones they ask me these questions. And when I come here, people say, oh no, it is really not true. And so there is this disconnect between what's happening in the rest of the world and what's happening here, and which I even found then. So, you know, I would want your opinion. And if I could be greedy to ask another question, then I'll sit down. You know, more than the journalists, I think it's the comedians who can cut through the chase and ask the real question. And that just stuns me how this happens again and again. What would you say, Adam? Do we, also, do we not know or do we not want to know? Um, well, you know, we can know if we want a huge amount of information and especially through the internet, you know, there's all kinds of information accessible to those who really want to know what's going on in, in other parts of the world or anywhere else. And even before the internet, it was all there in libraries and good books uh, for those who wanted it. But I think that uh, part of what you spoke about, of, of the, the abysmal ignorance of, of so many people in this country about what goes on in the rest of the world, the effects that American actions and policies have in the rest of the world is due to being a large country with oceans on either side uh, that is historically, despite the enormous power we wield, somewhat disconnected from the rest of the world. Um, one statistic that always astonishes and dismays me is that one half the members of the United States Congress do not have passports. That tells you something right there. Uh, 
so many parts of the world, you know, you, you, you go 100 miles in any direction and suddenly you're over a national border, you're, you're having to speak another language and so forth. Uh, that's not the case here. So I think there are many things that isolate us from the rest of the world. Our comfort, our wealth, our geography, um, our arrogance. And bridging them is, bridging over all those things is a big job. Your question here. Hi, thank you. Um, I wondered if either of you agree with Nicholas Kristof's assertion um, when he talks about t telling stories um, and trying to get news across in a media-saturated world, he tends to focus on an individual with the idea of hoping people with having looked at you know psych like different studies that say people care more about the individual, not about the statistic. So tell them the individual story, and he sometimes has to craft his narrative that way to try to really make it a story that people can connect with. And I wonder if that's something that Mother Jones has dealt with or that you think about. That's, an, that's a very interesting segue, too, from your question, because really that um, Christoph says that in the context of trying to get us to care about people who are far away and in many cases whose experiences do not seem like ours. And yet um, he finds that people do respond when you make them. I think there's even research that shows that if you, if you tell a story about two people, it's not half as effective yeah. as a story of one. Um, yeah. yeah, there was some study that where they, they did, I think it was a fundraising ad, and it was a picture of mm -hmm. an impoverished uh, girl in Haiti or somewhere, and the one appeal was, you know, help so-and-so go to school and get a roof over her head. Money came flooding in. Then they showed the same picture and it was help Haitian children, you know, go to school and get roof over their head, less money, and then some more broader appeal of, you know, poverty is a big problem in Haiti or something, still less money came in. People always want to feel a connection to a person. Um, I think the job of good writing, whether it's, it's uh, you know, magazine journalism or, or history books or anything else, is to find those individual stories, but to tell them in a way where people can sense the echo behind them. That it's not just a story of one person that you're, you're reading, um, but it's one person who stands for a whole mass of people. And this is a lesson that, um, you know, goes way back. I, one of the things I so much enjoy about, about um, uh, writing history is seeing earlier versions of people struggling with the same kinds of things that Monica and I have struggled with as journalists uh, today. How do you make people care about something? Um, one interesting example of this, uh, in the 1780s, when this remarkable anti-slavery movement came to life in, in, in Britain, what dialogue in, what public dialogue there had been on the subject of slavery up to that point in time had been mainly in terms of biblical argument. And you know, you can prove anything in the Bible. You can find one place where it says one thing, slavery's good and somewhere else where it says slavery is bad or whatever. Very little audience. Uh, then the abolitionists began um, to realize that what really made people sit up and pay attention was eyewitness testimony. How did they realize this? Because they were trying to get the British Parliament to do the first step of what they wanted, which was to abolish the slave trade. And they brought in dozens of witnesses, people who could testify about conditions on slave ships, conditions on West Indian plantations, and so forth. And ultimately, uh, there were something like 2,000 pages of testimony that were given to Parliament. Uh, they were afraid that uh, members of Parliament would get overwhelmed by this, and so they produced a pamphlet purely for members of parliament, which just took excerpts from all this testimony, you know, a paragraph or two uh, at a time, uh, 
and organized it by chapters. Conditions on the slave ships, slave punishments, conditions on the plantations, slave death rates, and so forth. And it was a, a little booklet of about 100 pages, totally of excerpts from eyewitness testimony before parliament, produced for members of parliament. Uh, there were some copies left over, and so they decided to see if there was an audience for them. It became the best-selling nonfiction anti-slavery book of all time. And it was still in print uh, 70 years later at the time of the American Civil War. They had discovered that eyewitness testimony is one way about individuals, but put in a context where it adds up to something with an echo, that this is a way you can really move people. Very much what uh, StoryCorps and other oral history projects do yeah. today. Um, I think we have time for two more questions, so let's take you over here. Hi, I'm Monica, you spoke about uh, the Twitter uh, kind of storytelling, and I'm just curious if you can talk a little bit more about other digital adaptations to uh, journalism and storytelling in this age today. Uh, we, you know, at Mother Jones have found um, digital storytelling, that have found digital media of all forms incredibly enriching for our storytelling because it allows us to um, come at the same story or the same echo, as Adam would put it, from many different directions. Um, so that, you know, a reporter might go out and start reporting a story and start tweeting, I'm finding this interesting detail, I've met this person, this person said, you know, some things that were really poignant, um, and it starts to build a context um, for people who follow that story who will eventually also read the larger piece, and for some people who are just, where that just becomes part of their stream. Um, you know, similarly, we, we can have reporters gather um, photos, gather video, you know, it, they're not, you know, professional photographers um, create much more finished and, you know, fantastic works that, you know, really have staying power, but some of this information that's gathered in the moment also enriches um, a reader's experience, and in fact, it's not really a reader's experience anymore, right? It's a, it's a storytellee's experience of um, a person becoming their guide to the world that the reporter is exploring. And being able to do that in real time through social media, through multimedia, and uh, you know, ways yet to be discovered is, is very, very powerful. Um, and then we still have the classic nonfiction narrative at the end. Um, and we can follow up on the nonfiction narrative with more short-term or multimedia reporting. It's, um, it's been, been fantastic for us. Is the reason why the narrative of climate change hasn't reached the American populace is because we have a segmented society where what went on, say, in the East Coast is basically far away from many people, just like it might as well be Iraq or Afghanistan? Well, would you say that the, you know, pictures of New York flooding have or have not connected? As a Co connected to the, the climate change issue. To, and, and to yeah. um, the public at large, to people who are not there. Well, uh, you mean whether they're, they're seeing the news of the, the hurricane and connecting it to, to a larger... Because, because I looked at the presidential polls, it's like, it's, it's like Romney lost nothing from, from this sense. Everybody said he would lose over this, but it, it hasn't damaged him. Well, and the polls, you know, are, are their own very strange narrative yeah. um, that I think, you know, ultimately um, tells a story that's fairly disconnected. Yeah. Um, in each individual poll yeah. tells a story that's fairly yeah. disconnected from the larger evolution of the campaign. But um, I'm curious if you think that watching the water come into New York and, you know, should forget New Jersey and all the other places affected had an impact on Americans that years and years of pontificating didn't in terms of bringing climate change? You know, I wish I could say it did, but I fear that it hasn't yet. Uh, I really, because I think there's a, there's a certain gear people get into when they watch natural disasters. Uh, 
you know, um, oh, you know, well, I, and I, was, I was just watching uh, myself a, a video, and of course there are thousands of these things now on the internet of you know, New York police rescuing people from the rooftops of houses and so forth. And of course what you're wondering is, is that child going to be rescued and winched up into the helicopter? Yes, she is, okay. Uh, I think there's a gear we get into when we're reading or watching about natural disasters. Isn't this terrible? Oh, those poor people who are suffering. Um, you know, where can I donate to help? And so on. I don't see enough people drawing the larger connections. It's a little bit hard because you cannot say this hurricane was caused by a changing climate, but you certainly, you know, weather is so complicated that you know, you can't uh, ascribe responsibility that easily, but you certainly can point to the larger yeah, but it's kind uh, of pattern. strange for a hurricane of this magnitude to hit New York at the end of October. <laughs> Maybe the August and September, usually the water is not that warm. Well, what, uh, you know, because, in part because we have to wind up, um, and in part because what you just said is really um, almost a picture-perfect setup for a plug for what Adam and I do in our different ways. It really is, it ends up being about the echo. Mm -hmm. You know, I think we don't know yet what the impact of these, this specific hurricane on um, people's thinking will be, but the hurricane also has an echo. It becomes part of, and as journalists, it's our obligation to set it into a larger context, you know, to set the story of the little girl on the rooftop into a larger context so that you can connect to that one moment, but you can also see that there will be other little girls for years and years to come in other disasters. And eventually, I think, if, you, if we tell the story well, those echoes settle into a change in, um, a change in the conversation. We sure hope so. <laughs> Otherwise, this isn't what we'd be doing. <laughs> Thank you all so much for coming. Yeah.